Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Dave Cole. Dave is the CEO and co-founder of Open Raven, a Kleiner Perkins-backed post-Series B company focused on reimagining data security for the modern era. He also started the Security Voices podcast as a sponsorless show focused on highlighting the diverse people and perspectives in cybersecurity. Dave's fingerprints are visible across the cybersecurity industry from his 26 years of working as a leader in consulting at Deloitte and ISS Enterprise Products, at Foundstone, CrowdStrike, and Tenable, and consumer products at Norton. Dave is a frequent spokesperson making appearances on NBC, CNN, and elsewhere while speaking at industry events such as RSA, Black Hat, and B-Sides Las Vegas. He holds a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and is a member of the board of UM School of Information and Inspective. Dave is an investor focused on helping to grow businesses in his hometown of Los Angeles, where he lives with his wife and son. Welcome, Dave. So good to see you. Thanks for joining. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire. Are you ready? Let's go. I'm going to uh, give. I'm going to give you an easy one to to start. Um, I know you're really obsessed with LA, but I'm going to hit you with beach or mountains. Beach. Of course, yes, because you chose your beautiful spot there. Um, uh, <laughs> if there was a book written about your life, what would it be called? I'll tell you what it would be like. It would be an adventure. It would be in, in some form of epic adventure where the character follows um, an equal combination of their heart and their whims, their serendipity, and ends up in all sorts of places they never intended to be, meeting all sorts of people they never expected to be with. And at the end of it, they figure out that they're just about as happy and as accomplished as they decide that they are. Oh, I like that. That's like wisdom, right? That's reflection and wisdom. I love that. Okay. If you, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? I think, you know, and this is something that I actually work on. But I had a friend once uh, when I was in college. He was a senior. I was a freshman. And I watched this person. His name is Mark Stoll. He's no longer with us. But he had this ability when he spoke to people to make you feel like you were the only one in the room that he would, that was that mattered to him. And the impact he had on people was profound. It was just this deep listening and focus. And it impacted me deeply. And, and I just watched him with other people, like the, the charisma and the connection that he had. And I've always tried to become that type of listener and, and build that type of connection with people because it was amazing to see. And I think it's, it's all the more appealing because it's real, you know, yeah. I mean, yes, I'd love to fly. Yes. I'm, I'm a diver. I'd love to hold my breath underwater for like hours and go down into the depths. But at the end of the day, like that's something that actually like I can work on and I've seen the impact of it and it's, it's magical. Well, that's amazing. I think I've asked this question a lot. I don't ask it every time. Um, cause obviously rapid fire, other, otherwise people would know what I'm asking, but I do ask it frequently and I love the answers people give. You're the only person who's ever given something that's like super attainable. And I actually, having met you, I think you're good at that. I don't think it's like such a stretch. I think you you actually are, you've, you're close. If, the, if you're not um, there, I can tell you that, um, you know, I would imagine that Mark would be proud. I don't know how he passed away, but. <laughs> oh, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, 20 years of work and more to yeah. go. So Yeah, no, it's great. What are the three attributes that you feel are the most important attributes um, that make someone successful as an entrepreneur? Ooh, um, first off, you know, you have to be 100% committed. Uh, most people give up before they're done and just don't persevere. And there's this mythology that you have to have the best idea. You know, you have to like, oh, well, it's just, you know, the crowning achievement was coming up with some great idea. The idea is honestly like such a small percentage of it. A lot of it is just continuing to do it when you don't feel like doing it anymore. Yeah. And pushing through the spots where it sucks and iterating and not being satisfied when you hit a wall or or hit a lull and saying, you know what, not asking, not feeling like, oh, well, God, I guess we failed. It's like, no, 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 no. 
what's the adjustment? What's the change that needs to be made here? Do I need to be a little more patient? Do I need to think about it differently? Um, so I'd say like perseverance is just dramatically, I think the most important thing. Um, secondly, I think it's, um, it, it's having an incredibly open mind. Your things are going to change. I mean, we started the company right before a pandemic and the situation changed. Um, the fundraising environment changed dramatically in the past year, year and a half uh, from where it was before. How do you adapt to that? We have employees in the Ukraine who are dear to us. How do you deal with employees who are in a war-torn country? Um you know, there's just all these situations where you look at it and it's like, okay, what does the situation demand for me? So it's this, it's this open mind and it's this willing to rethink your, you know, your precepts and and what leadership is and so on. Um, after that, I, I think it's just, honestly, it's energy. It's like, you've just got to bust your tail. Like you'd like to say, you'd like to say it differently, but if you don't persevere, if you're not adaptable, you, you know, you're not going to get there, but at the end of the day, you got to have a motor. You better have a V8 engine up in there in order to drive through. Because even if you're adaptable, even if you persevere, if you're slow, you'll get run over. Yeah. I love those. Love, love, love. Um, if you could be famous for something, like anything, athlete, actor, writer, entrepreneur, uh, what would you choose? Ooh, it's a toss up. It's a toss up. And there are two things that I want to do in the future. So one would be, um, I'd love to be a pianist of all oh. things. Um, I love music. I absolutely have no talent whatsoever, but I've like, I used to be like Harry Connick Jr. And, and, you know, loved him, you know, singing at the piano and all of that. And recently, like my tastes have gone more classical uh, Claude Debussy and so on. Um, so I want to learn how to play Claire de Lune and maybe uh, play in an audience. And then my son playing tennis has awoken me to how amazing tennis is as a sport. It'd be super fun to play tennis at a high level too. So yeah, we'll see. I've asked this question also. And a few people have said famous tennis player because they feel that that's one that you can be like famous enough that you can still go in public. And also... Um, have the feeling of like conquering something, but also have the international exposure and travel. Um, yeah, tennis would be a good one. Um, okay. Did you have any childhood nicknames? Or do you have any nicknames right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, no good ones. <laughs> none no you good say, ones. None that no. you can say on the podcast. No, not, not even particularly profane ones. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, there was a guy who used to call me gravy. It's like, Oh, we'll throw Dave in a meeting and it'll make it better. Just like gravy. Um, nice. he's a very sweet, very, very fun sales guy. Um, and, but most times, um, I just go by in a lot of places, there's so many Daves, uh, that I just go by DC for Dave yeah, Cole, well, that's so, what that's what I was asking yeah. because, like, my husband's David, and sometimes people call him Dave, mostly David. Um, and I feel like we're always in a room of lots of Davids, so um, always figured that there might be some nicknames. So tell me, I mean, I you're uh, you're from Michigan, right? You grew up that's there, that's right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me about growing up there. I've actually never been there, which is crazy. And I've met so many people from there and I, I have yet to meet somebody that uh, is not really super cool and kind from there. Oh, wow. That's, that's a high bar for a Michigander. Tell me about your childhood there. Yeah. So I was born in Toledo, Ohio. And then my, um, my father got a job in Battle Creek, Michigan. And we moved to a street called Hogue Road, which was a dead end street in the middle of the sticks. My father was a nurse and anesthetist there. And um, my mother, so both parents come from big families. My dad actually flunked out of college. My mom was told she was not smart enough to go to college. And basically she supported us while my dad, after he flunked out of college, he was drafted uh, and he was on the GI Bill. 
So my mother supported us um, by working at um, at a beauty salon. Um, my dad finally graduated, and we broke out of Ohio uh, with no delay up to Battle Creek, Michigan, which if it sounds familiar, Battle Creek, Michigan is the home of Kellogg's and Post. Ah. So at the time, yeah, you would wake up in the morning and the entire city would smell like cereal. <laughs> um, it was... <laughs> It was okay. I mean, you just sort of tune it out, right, after a while. But I actually even went to University of Michigan. When I went to school, I had a, a very small scholarship from Kellogg's that they, like, throw at you as one of the top students in the uh, in the community. So it was um, – look, I had a great childhood. I have, I have fond memories. It wasn't perfect, but it was very much a childhood spent like, like I'm sure so many other people who live in kind of rural areas, like you get kicked out of the house in the morning and you're told to come back maybe for lunch, but especially for dinner. Yeah. You know, it was, it was kind of that. Um, Much simpler than, than the childhood that our kids are having for sure. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, they're, I think, you know, and sometimes I'll like, I'll contrast for my son who's 11, like how he's growing up versus I did. I mean, he's so much more worldly and informed and, and smart than, than I was. But having said that, I had a lot of time to indulge my creativity. It was a much more relaxed lifestyle. Um, we were in front of um, a forest or a swamp, depending on the time of year. And we had just some amazing adventures, like just going out and playing in the forest or like tooling around the swamp when it turned into one. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say we, who's the we siblings? Oh yeah. I had older sister, but generally like, you know, much like so many kids, I think of that age, it was a dead end street. So we had a, a maid, we had like a posse. That was, yeah. There. I, had know, the, I had, I had the same thing. And I was like the baby of the posse. There was probably I had a cul-de-sac too. There was like 20 kids, similar type of thing. We would just be out all day riding our bikes around and it would literally be like, come home for dinner. And it was the best, 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 same thing in the forest, riding through. And you think back and you're like, wait, we didn't have phones. Like, I mean, it was so, I think of it as being pretty um, idyllic. I really do. Yeah. Like I, I look really fondly back at that. But you also mentioned like, so your dad, um, I think you just said failed or flunked out of college. Yeah. And, um, so was, is that the kind of thing where he said, um, cause Michigan's obviously a killer school. Um, like my kids are going to make up for that and go to great schools. Or was that all kind of coming from within from you? From, from within. Yeah. My sister actually kind of blazed the trail. She was three years older than me and she went to Western Michigan, which was a good school. So at first I was like, oh, I'll go to Western Michigan. I'll get a great scholarship. This will be fine. But I didn't get the scholarship I wanted. And being like a competitive person, I was like, well, screw this. Like, screw Western Michigan. I'm not going to go there. And um, I, I kind of decided Michigan late. It was, um, I was looking at a private school that I would have liked better that was in the area. Um, but it was just expensive. And my parents said, look, here's how much money you have for college. This is what we saved. You can either take this or and go to Michigan, or you can go to, you know, said private school, it's called Kalamazoo College and pay us back. And I looked at it and said, Michigan's great. Why wouldn't I just go there? Yeah. And they tried to dissuade me from it. They're like, look, you went to a small school, small town. Like, you know, we're not like my mom had gone back to school, but at the community college there and became an accountant, which was amazing to see. And um, but I mean, honestly, it wasn't there wasn't any academic tradition in the family whatsoever. And they were worried about me getting lost. I said, no, 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 I got this. And sure enough, I did, you know, I went yeah. off to university of Michigan and it was amazing. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. And would you say that was kind of where you, um, like the beginning of kind of thriving or was high school, like a really successful period for you? High school was awesome. I mean, I, I not without its styles and so forth and look, I played a lot of sports, but I was a super mediocre athlete. So I was, I had, I have athletic skills made for academia. So <laughs> I, I was, um, I played a lot of sports, nothing that I was terribly good at, but I really enjoyed it. Nonetheless, I had a great time, um, did well in school. You know, it was, yeah. I honestly, like I have, I have no complaints. I had 
a decidedly like middle class upbringing, dead end street in front of a swamp, like for half my childhood. But it was it was idyllic, like you said, and, and yeah. I was allowed to follow my muse, and I had enough competitive fire in me, and my sister kind of showed me, you know, showed me a little bit of what's possible. And I just kind of kept built upon that and took it to the next level. But I very much had the space that I needed and a lot of um, the drive and everything was already inside me. And, you know, it's funny, I, I see it in my own son and I I read a fair bit and listen to things. And, you know, it feels like so much of it is just nature, you know, yeah. it's inside you. And it was there. And I was, I was very fortunate, very blessed to have the space just to let that evolve. And Michigan just gave me more space to kind of build on that. So, yeah. yeah. Was... Are you in touch um, with your friends from like fifth grade, middle school, like that period? And if I were to meet them today and say like, hey, David's a, a tech entrepreneur, would that surprise them? Was that like, oh, yeah, we could have said that. Like, yeah. we could have called that back then. Yeah, they would have. I, I, it, surprised, it would surprise exactly no one. I mean, I've always been... I've always been roughly this way. So no, they're not surprised. I still have one buddy from, from junior high up until now that I stay in touch with. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, he's, that, that's no, always one, no one's surprised. I've been very driven even from the beginning, super yeah. competitive, high energy, disciplined, you know, that sort of thing. Like I yeah. wake up in the morning and ask my mom, like, what are we doing today? Like, what's yeah. the plan? What, what do you remember? And like, I guess it has it changed. Like what, what are you driven by? I mean, when I hear people are competitive, is it um, kind of more fear-based or more kind of, a, a, I guess there are people who say, you know, I was doubted and I want to prove people wrong or, um, you know, I want to win or I want to make someone proud or like, what is it about for you when you say you're competitive? There's always an element of, you know, you want to, you want to prove someone wrong, or you want to, you know, you want to get to a place that someone said you couldn't get to. So as much as like, yes, I'm driven. I, I love watching things grow. I love it. Whether it's, it's people, whether it's the evolution of a product, I'm a diehard product person, whether it's a garden, like I love it. I just, I love the little insights I love like, you know, the green shoots that come up. I got a message two weekends ago from a guy who worked at me as a VP of product marketing and said, Hey, I learned this from you and it's really helped me. And that like, it made my whole weekend. It was amazing. Um, but having said that, like, those are all like the positive things. I think anybody who's truly competitive will tell you like, there's all of that. And there's also a bit of piss and vinegar if we're totally honest, where it's like, I'll show you like, yeah, I thought I couldn't get there. Like, let's go. You know, mm -hmm. let's go. I'm going to get up earlier than you. I'm going to finish stronger. You know, I'm going to push through. It's yeah. So I'd say like, you know, there's both it's equal forces. It's absolutely yin and yang. I think it's, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Yeah. A lot of people say that that's so interesting. And did you remember when you were, I guess, when you went to Michigan, did you have a sense of kind of what you wanted to be when you grew up? Were you driving towards something or was it like, let me go study business um, what did you major in? Yeah. So my first two, I mean, my first year, I like, I was really good at foreign language. I loved it. And my first year, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I just took a bunch of language courses. And of course, like, you know, I took Spanish and Japanese, Spanish because I loved it, Japanese because I thought it would be really, really hard. And I wanted to be the best uh, Japanese student at University of Michigan. And I came super close there was a Korean guy, Choi San, wherever you are, uh, I could never <laughs> beat him. I came super close and they gave out ratings, you know, every, every week. Um, but after that, I realized, oh God, I'm not going to be an interpreter. I'm not going to be a diplomat. Um, I need to like figure something else out. And I figured, you know what? I'll just go into this business school so I can get a job so I could sustain myself. I mean, I very much looked, I mean, when we were young, my mom didn't make much money. My grandparents my, watched over us. My grandmothers watched over us for the first five, six years. We lived off food stamps, you know, and whatever we could scrape together. It wasn't, I, I knew deep, kind of deep inside, I knew what it was to kind of scrape by. I didn't want to scrape by. I knew I had to like 
I had to do something that made money. So I looked at it and said, smart enough to get into B school, I'll apply to business school, you know, undergrad business school. And I don't know what I'll do there, but I'll do something and my language skills won't hurt. So I kind of balanced my language lessons alongside um, all the prereqs for business, got into B school, and then really fell in love with um, with technology. It was around the time that the internet, it was becoming obvious what it was to become. And I fell in love with it. And I just, I couldn't get an internship anywhere. I failed out of like eight interviews my junior year. Like I lived in a house with like 10 other guys and we all posted up all our rejection messages on the wall. <laughs> we had the wall of shame <laughs> and a good like half of those were mine. And so I got stuck in Ann Arbor for the summer. I said, well, what am I going to do? Like, well, I'm going to code. And I took on like three, four jobs, took coding classes and refactored myself as, you know, a person in technology and, you know, graduated and went right into tech. So yeah, it was That's brilliant. Like best yeah. move ever. So what was your first job right out of school? Um, I was, man, it was great. It was Deloitte and Touche at the time. I think it's just Deloitte now, but they were, they had started consulting their consulting practice. And the only job I could get was in computer security. And they said, well, you know, come out here and do this. I said, oh my God, that sounds so boring. Like, and I'm not a terribly risk averse person. So me working in security was kind of comical, but I'd fallen in love with Los Angeles. I just, I came out on a spring break with a friend who had a brother in Cerritos, which is only notable for its auto mall. And basically I, I looked at it and said, my God, these people are happy. These people are beautiful. The weather's beautiful. It's like, would I like to be happy in a beautiful place full of beautiful people who are enjoying themselves? Yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> and while I made some not so amazing decisions in my 20s, that one has held true up until now. Um, so yeah, I passed a point recently where I realized I lived longer in LA than I had in Michigan. And I kind of you know, set down my Michigander status and I'm a, I'm a semi-native Los Angelino now, I suppose. Yes, it, you are. So Deloitte, got, you, know, you were there for a while. So consulting and then ISS. Yeah. Well, what happened is um, I looked at this and I, and it was fine. Like it was fun, but I had a friend who said, you need to join this high flying startup here. Who's making some really amazing stuff in tech land. I said, yeah, I'd like to get more technical again. Like I was starting to get pretty technical and now I've gotten a little fluffy over here at Deloitte. Um, let me dig in. So I went over to ISS, which was an amazing company at the time. And um, I was a consultant. I was doing incident response, basically some of the early Chinese hacks. Um, I was called in to help drive the response. Um, we did things, security assessments, like, can you break into OpenTable? I was one of my customers at the time and a bunch of others. So it was super fun. Um, but I was working with the products the company had and I was dealing with the product people and I felt like they weren't really listening to me. And I felt like there was a place where they could take one particular line of products that they had that they weren't interested in going. And I ran into some folks who were one of my former consultants who said, hey, you should talk to these guys. They've got similar ideas to you. And sure enough, I did. I'm like, yeah, I got to do this. Like, I'm going to go build this product. Like, we've got this idea. Like, these guys are already onto it. Like, let's go. So I jumped in order to go build a product for the first time in like right around the year 2000. So, and this marks my 23rd year building cybersecurity products. <laughs> what was that company and what was that like business model? And how did you even know what you were doing as far as like, um, you know, how do you start it? How do you raise money? The yeah. whole thing like that, that's something that there's no playbook necessarily, unless you had a mentor. Well, I was, they'd already started the company. So I was, I was along for the ride. They brought me in yeah. as the product person, <laughs> but they didn't know what they, they didn't know what they were doing. It was their first time building a company. It was my first time building a product. So um, the level of cluelessness was through the roof. Um, but having said that, you know, we, we proceeded undaunted because we had a whole bunch of technical knowledge and domain knowledge and we parlayed that into, I'd say, like a semi-successful business. Uh, the company was called Foundstone. And the alumni from that company are amazing. I mean, it's literally some of the most impressive people to ever work in cybersecurity. Um, and there's a few groups like that, but Foundstone's one of the most special. Um, it wasn't a super successful business. 
we were a little early. Um, we were building what's now called the vulnerability management category. And we just didn't know how to lay down the right foundation. And we didn't know how to play the long game. We weren't patient enough. Um, we were a little too early from the market and we ended up selling uh, about four, four and a half years into it, maybe five since they'd started a little earlier than me. And we sold to McAfee, um, which was a decent sale at the time, um, but I wasn't very interested in it. I'd worked with the product and been through some really hard yards. So I basically, when they made the transition, I quit straight away and went to Australia and just went to Australia for a month and went scuba diving and rented like a van and drove up to Cape Tribulation, you know, from Cairns and, you know, spent time just like underwater mostly, but also <laughs> in the jungles and just kind of cleansing my palate before I took another job. Was your, was your plan to kind of really decompress for a while and then you got a bug? Was it like, I can't do this for very long. And then, um, you know, what happens next? Cause sometimes, you know, I talk to people all the time who are like, don't call me about any jobs or, you know, I'm really trying to decompress and take a break and regroup. <laughs> and then they're like, I can't stop. I have an idea or someone calls them or they run into somebody they used to work with. Like what kind of uh, brought you back in? N need. <laughs> if I could have, <laughs> I would have stayed in Australia for a long, long time. Um, but need and a girlfriend who was to become my wife, um, you know, kind of pulled me back and yeah, I, I had, I had a condo to pay for and didn't have that much in savings. And, you know, so, but I realized like I, I wanted to build products at scale and learn from people who knew what they were doing. I'd like, I learned a lot. I learned more than I knew at the time, but you know, I had that thing of like, wow, there's, there's all this stuff out there that I don't know. It would be awesome to work in an organization who has it all figured out. You know, fast forward to the answer. Nobody has it all figured out. And once you do, it changes. But having said that, the desire to work inside an organization that was building products at tremendous scale was what I wanted. And I found that at Symantec. So, and Symantec at the time was amazing. I mean, it just kind of fell apart, um, largely kind of over my tenure there. But I got exactly what I wanted out of it. Um, yeah. It was, I mean, it was a tremendous learning experience. And I got a whole bunch of opportunities to do cool stuff. Like I did broadcast media, you know, I got to do, you know, got to talk on CNN and NBC and I got to do all sorts of cool research opportunities and work with the federal trade commission and all sorts of things, you know, brush up against congressional testimony. And it was, it was amazing. Um, and I ran Norton, I ran the Norton product line for half a decade and pulled it out of being fast and slow to being super duper fast and good again, and then tried to bring the product line into the future. So yeah. it was it was an amazing experience. Um, and it was nice to be in a big company after being in a small one. I, I mean, I don't believe that there's startup people or big company people. I enjoy them both. Like I've got no problem. Um, I'll probably work in a large organization again at some point and I'll enjoy it. I mean, there's, there's absolute advantages to both. There are definitely advantages to both. I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree that there's not necessarily big company and small company people, because there are definitely people who do not do well in startups. They just can't deal with the ambiguity. They can't, all those things that you were talking about, the grit, the perseverance, the energy, um, you know. A lot of startups that I work with when they're recruiting don't even want to see people out of certain large companies who outsource everything or who, you know, they've got layers and meetings about meetings. Um, startups, you just have to be so, like you were saying, so much energy, so quick, less bureaucracy. But I understand. Yeah. But you're you're like more of a unicorn, though. There's not that many people who are super strong at both. Um and some people who are entrepreneurs who could never work in a large company. Yeah. Um, but you, you are like, yeah, you're unique. I don't know that it's everybody. So of the different companies that you've worked for, like which one has been, which ones have been kind of your favorites or that have been um, most influential as far as um, informing, I guess, the type of company that you wanted to, to start as far as culture and, um, just intention and values and all of that when you um, started Open Raven. 
Yeah, I mean, I I took something from each one of them. I really did. And from leaders at each place, I'd say CrowdStrike, um, I learned, I came in pretty early in CrowdStrike. I'd known George from Foundstone, who's the CEO there. And the product excellence that George drove, um, he did a great job and just creating space for me to get the product out in the right way and just the speed and the competitiveness. Those were all things that I wanted to pull from George. Um, I had an amazing boss at Symantec for a period of time and a couple of them. One of them was uh, Janice Chafin and Janice was just fundamentally sound and knew how to like guide people's careers and make decisions that balance head and heart. Um, I was fortunate to work with a, a visionary a guy by the name of Roland Trollope, who is an amazing storyteller. Um, from Tenable, uh, I went in there and it was a mom and pop um, that was trying to grow up and get through a growth phase. I don't think I realized it at the time, but some of the things that I took away from that is just how you can bootstrap something and how you can do something lean and just really focus on, you know, keeping something growing at a natural pace and not have to have all the, the niceties and the amenities and things don't have to be perfect and they don't have to be, you know, first class and so forth. Sometimes, sometimes it's just about getting through and mm -hmm. like this, the that. scrappiness. Yeah. Yeah. Just that scrappiness was there and they grew that into a, um, into an, a company that IPO and has done quite well. So yeah, there's just, just instrumental lessons from all these places, if you keep your eyes open, you know, and, and you keep your mind equally open, you know, there was something to be learned from every one of these experiences. Yeah. And tell me about Open Raven. So how did you come up with the name and what's, I guess, what was the original business idea and model and how has that changed or stayed the same? You know, it's funny. Um, it stayed largely the same. I mean, we had an insight. It took like three to four months to really center on the right idea. And I've got this 40, 50 page like diary of a madman where I was out interviewing people, friends, security leaders. Um, I was listening to webinars. I was reading research and asking questions of investors. And some of this I did out in the open. I was, um, I was running Security Voices, the podcast. So literally the investors I'd be talking to. I'd have them on the podcast. So if you want to like hear some of the early days of Open Raven, you can do it on Security Voices and you can actually see the investors that I was talking to because they were on the podcast. So it was um it was it was fun. It was fairly public, but I would take all these notes and I had the we had the idea wrong in the first like 3 to 4 months. We were kind of marching down a more mundane space where there was already a leader. And people kept directing us back to this data security space. And the insight that we had was that there was a huge need for a data security company that had cloud, modern kind of cloud sensibilities um, that wasn't trying to sell to privacy and trying to like check the regulatory box for people. And also wasn't trying to sell to data teams, but was trying to catch up the security teams and the cloud engineering teams to the data economy. You know, the data people had just sort of run ahead. These data science teams had grown dramatically. The intelligence, the analytics, you know, the tooling that they had, you know, tons of open source, lots of commercial products that keep getting better and better. Look at Databricks, look at Snowflake, look at DBT, look at all these amazing companies. What did the security teams and the cloud teams have to keep up with them? And the answer was not a hell of a lot. So mm -hmm. the concept was, bring them the tooling, the platform that would allow them to catch up and know where all the data is, know what type of data they have and make sure that it was protected in the right way, make painful things like compliance, super easy and so on. And that was the insight. And we were in a market with really only us and like a couple companies. And then all of a sudden, like the gates broke through in late 2021. We started in 2019. In late 2021, early 2022, I mean, they just came out of the woodworks and it was, oh, yeah, yeah, it was incredible validation of our concept and what we were doing a little bit scary too. We're like, oh my God, like, you know, we went from like, you know, went for a jog in the wilderness and all of a sudden we find ourselves in like the New York marathon, like 
wow, this is different. Yeah. Um, but it's also incredible validation that we were onto something at that time. Um, so, you know, the name, um, comes from a few things. So one, we have an open source core and we felt like we we're further along, you know, in our careers, I've been at this since 96. We said the companies that we respect and that we, you know, feel a connection to all have an open source core. And that level of transparency is really important, especially for cloud engineers and security engineers. The platform needs to be accessible. It needs, they need to be able to look at it and understand and see the code in certain areas to attest to the quality and even extend it. Um, but it also is a spirit of transparency and candor that we try and foster inside the company. On the Raven side, um, what we were trying to do there is we, when we were talking to people about the problem, they had this inability to see things from a distance, right? The canonical bird's eye view, right? See it from a distance and visualize what they have. And the product has inside it this wonderful 3D map that we've worked really hard to make great and make scale and so on. So the concept was be able to see it from far away, but also ravens are really smart creatures who are good at finding little things. So the concept was that it would go and it would actually find the sensitive data inside the environment that needs to be protected. Now there's a whole geekier angle to this. If you're thinking they were probably drinking while they were naming it, you'd be absolutely right. <laughs> um, and it started to say like, well, what are, what are the aesthetics do we want, you know, for the brand, for the company? And we decided on this very Scandinavian aesthetic and I love mythology. And so we're like, yeah, you know, and actually like Odin has these two ravens, you know, Hunan and Munin who are memory and thought. And what do they do? They go out every day and they survey, you know, all the different levels of, you know, the Norse mythology. They can see every level and bring back the news to Odin. So like the customer would be like Odin and, the, you know, the products. Wow. The, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a couple of really that's, strong That's like many, in. many cocktails in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> But if you go into the code base, you know, you'd find names like, you know, Odin and Midgard and, you know, and the rest. I love of that. So, yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. love that. And so what's the business model and who are you selling into? So we sell to cloud security architects, security engineering teams, and to a certain degree, cloud engineering teams. Um, and, you know, what, what are we doing for them? Lots of times we're just helping them contain sprawl. We're not the security company who like, We'll try to keep the boogeyman out of your environment. Oh, we'll tell you when the Russians or the Chinese or the NSA is in there. Like, we are the company that helps you stay on top of your data and keeps it from leaking, being breached, getting stale, creating risk, creating too much, you know, driving too much budget, you know, gobbling up too much budget because the data shouldn't be there. And we help folks to put real guardrails around their data so it stays in check. So at the end of the day, like, you know, we're selling to people who have that problem, not the privacy folks. Like I'm, I'm too old. I can't get up in the morning and build a product to check the box for an attorney. Uh, attorneys are lovely people. My wife's one, but mm -hmm. I, you know, no interest in selling them and selling to them. And on the flip, you know, data teams are another animal as well. They have their tooling. So, you know, we want to build a beautiful, extensible, scalable platform for our customers, you know, usually it's under the chief information security office, whoever owns security in order to, you know, get really fast questions um, to where their data is and help them automate keeping it under control. It's a direct sales model. So yeah. we're trying to build a category. We're building a product that's much needed, but doesn't have an existing budget. Um, doing that during a pandemic and an insurrection and a recession has been an extreme sport. Like it's been a hell of an adventure. Um, but having said that, the one area where we're not trying to innovate at all is like a super funky sales model or anything else. It is, you know, enterprise, direct or channel sales, you know, straight, no chaser, nothing, nothing strange. Yeah. And what's your differentiator as far as you said, like, hey, we were kind of on a jog and all of a sudden we're in the New York Marathon. Like, are these people on your tail and what are they doing as far as competing? Um, you know, how are you setting yourselves apart? Yeah, it's a dogfight. I mean, any any good market, like if you find yourself in a category by yourself, you're not in a category at all. So the funny thing is if you're successful, you end up with a ton of comp competition. And if you don't like to compete, why the hell did you become an entrepreneur to begin with, right? 
It's like, so for us, when it came out, it was like tremendous validation. It was really fast. And as was the style in 2020 and 2021, it was hyper-capitalized. So you look at it and you're like, I think you may have grabbed a lot of money. I hope you can live into that valuation, friend. Yes. But um, one of the things that we saw was, as in, in accordance with the times, valuation is very high. The amount of capital that was raised was a lot. And, you know, to the point to where you start to question, it's like, are you going to be able to grow into that? Like, I hope you know how to hold on to that capital. Um, You're, you're going to need it. And your future self is not going to be happy with you if you don't. Yeah. And how about, how about you guys? How did you fund the business and how much have you raised so far? Are you in a series B? Yeah, we're, it's funny. So we've raised the same amount of money as a series A in our space, but we've raised it over three rounds. So we did our first round in um, the heady pre-pandemic days of 2019 um, with Upfront, who is one of the bigger VCs here in LA. Um, we raised our subsequent round with Kleiner Perkins uh, when you know we were the first virtual deal ever done, uh, when partner meetings were all in person. If you go out on, uh, I think it's Business Insider, you'll hear um, Mamoun out there, who's a senior partner, talking about like a deal they did over Zoom. That was our very first one because it was the day the markets crashed and they didn't want anybody traveling and everyone was concerned. So we did it. And that was our Series A with Kleiner Perkins. Like having never met in person? Yeah. You know, what's funny is um, we had met, the only way it worked is we had already met in person a bunch Mm. of times. Mm. And I... Highly recommend it, whether it's sales or investors, like you need that in-person trust and having done it. So in many ways, we we put in the work before that meeting with them. And that was why it worked. It wasn't like we had some magical deck, you know, pitch deck that wooed them, you know, at times of great stress and, you know, pulled the money out of their pockets or mm-hmm. I've got, you know, some honeyed tongue and was able to persuade them having never met like that's a bunch of crap. We'd put in the time with them to build the trust so that when it went to a point where it was Zoom, we were already known quantities with yes. there. So yeah, it doesn't, it just doesn't work that way, you know. So you've raised three rounds and are you comfortable saying how much you've raised so far and where yeah. you are with all this? Yeah. I mean, it's it's all out there. So our last round was with um Pelion out of Salt Lake City, Pelion Ventures, um, venture partners, and with Incutel. Um, the investment branch of the intelligence community, U.S. intelligence community, we raised uh, forty, uh, right around forty million in total. So, wow, that's yeah. a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> it doesn't feel like much. <laughs> well, I know because you're like, hey, I gotta. I mean, because it's been it's been a little bit, but it's. Um, I mean, it is. It definitely is a lot, and I know that it probably doesn't feel like a lot. It's. It's, it feels like you're in like a very hot area though. I mean, obviously like the, the cool area. Um, we're getting a lot of business right now, obviously in AI, but data security is just huge. Yeah. You know, it's funny, but people understand what we're doing now since chat GPT became a thing and people started to wrap their heads around generative AI it was one of the, it made the elevator pitch so much easier. Just look mm-hmm. at people and say, hey, you know what's behind ChatGPT and all these things? Large large language models. What do they operate on? Massive troves of really important data. What we do is we protect that and make sure that it stays safe. And all of a sudden they're like, got it, get it. I totally get the value of the data. As before that, I don't think people really grokked the value of data or data science as well. But all of a sudden, like, it was funny, like I showed my parents when they were out over Christmas, I introduced them to chat GPT and we had some fun with it. And I did the same thing with my son. And, you know, it's just like, they get it now. They're like, oh, they're like, that was on the news the other day when I caught up with them this weekend, that chat GPT, we get it. If you can understand generative AI and where AI is going, you can also understand the value of data. If you can understand the value of data, you know intrinsically why you need to protect it. Proprietary data sets like need to be well defended because they're the lifeblood of the future business. Yes, definitely. So tell me, you started to talk about, um, you know, I know you guys are dispersed, you're remote first, and you've got people in Ukraine and kind of people everywhere. How has that been for you um, as a leader, trying to kind of create a culture, create synergy, also kind of dealing with the whole lack of ability to have kind of um, 
like innovate sitting on a whiteboard? Um, how do you like what tools are you using? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I've been doing remote really since CrowdStrike. So back in 2013. So I've got a playbook that's about 10 years old and a bunch of things I've borrowed from other people and things that work, things that don't work and so on. So there's a fallacy, and I think it really came up during the pandemic, that remote work means you don't get together. I, I think it's patently false. Like that was crisis work at that time. That wasn't remote work. Like remote work isn't having your entire family like jammed into a house where you're trying to get like a seven or eight year old, you know, on Zoom. <laughs> like that isn't that isn't remote work. Right. Real remote work does entail getting together in person occasionally and getting in front of a whiteboard because I don't think there's a substitute for it. And if you don't get together in person on occasion, you pay a trust tax. Like people will not trust each other enough in order to go fast. You will slow down because you have a burden of the team just not functioning the way that it should. So we've tried to get the team together in mass at least once or twice a year and encourage our teams to get together regularly. And we use WeWork in order to allow people to get together as they need to and form bands and get together in, in whatever location makes sense, whether it's New York or whether it's SoCal or whether it's the Bay Area, WeWork supports that really, really well. Um, so we do get together. We don't get together all the time, um, but we do get together as we need to pay down the trust tax or we need to design something, or we need to get ready for a launch. If we don't plan a launch together in person, a big marketing one, it takes two times the time that, that it needs if we just get in the room for a day and it's far less creative. So I'm not sure there is a substitute to getting in yeah. person, but I'm also equally certain you don't need that all the time. You right. just don't. And how about onboarding new employees? Like say tomorrow you hire an engineer. Is there something that you're like, hey, this is best practice that I've picked up along the way to get that person onboarded, integrated, to just understand how we think, how we do business, expectations, all of it, how to be successful? Yeah. So anytime someone comes on, one of my employees, and I encourage everyone on the team to do this, I create a first 90 days document that walks them through everything and make sure that I check in with them on a regular basis you know, not even every, every week, but like every, every couple of days, you know, we're working together on things. Um, ideally people get together in their first 90 days. Like, let's get, let's get you somewhere. Like, let's find an excuse, not arbitrary, but like something you're working on that requires high fidelity communication. Like let's get together and let's work through that and make that faster and make that better for you. Um, assigning a partner and making sure that they have an assigned buddy that they're working with, um, who can make sure that they're connected to the organization and so on. We do little things like, um, there's an application called donut on Slack, uh, where you do like virtual coffee with people. That's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Um, every Monday morning, we did this today. We have brunch together. Um, and we all sit down at 9am and we have a cycle where each team, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing, whether it's product or GNA and, and customer success, like they have every, every four weeks you're up and you talk through and you give updates and you bring people from the team to give updates. We also have this thing called water cooler. on Thursdays at nine 15 Pacific. Um, we get, we sit down and sometimes we just play games together. We have Irene who's amazing on our team who, where we play super cool games like geo guesser. And we break off into breakout rooms. Other times, someone will give a presentation, a show and tell, something about their personal life. Sometimes, like this week, it'll be walking through a report for a new customer and all talking through that together and what we see, what was hard about that, what was easy, where we can improve, and so on. But remote culture, you you have to have a you have to be very intentional about it. You have to season it with in-person. And you know, it's it's not easy. It's it's really not easy. And I think what we've seen is that satisfaction levels with remote work go up the further in your career you are and the more complex your life is and more flexibility you demand. And it goes down as you have younger people. And I think that's one of the things that everybody's struggling with now is how do you onboard young talent into a remote organization? It's incredibly difficult. And I'm not sure anybody's cracked the code yet. What we did at CrowdStrike 
was we set up distributed centers. As we got bigger and grew, we basically had areas where we concentrated people, where there were senior leaders there, and we started putting younger people into those areas. Um, because otherwise, like your failure rate is very, very high bringing on young talent into remote orgs. Well, 100% for so many reasons. I mean, beyond uh, too many reasons to list from like, there's nowhere really for them to work at home. They might have roommates to like, they're la- they need they need a little bit more structure and they need mentorship. Um, and just the like osmosis of what they're learning, just sitting um, shoulder to shoulder with people. In my office, I mean, if I'm in the office uh, working, sometimes I'm like, wow, if I hadn't been sitting here and listening and realizing like what they're saying on the phone just could be so much better, <laughs> just polished up a little bit, but than just sitting next to me and realizing that could have happened at home and it would have just not come off right um, makes me want everybody in the office. But then you realize it's a recruiting challenge these days and companies who are making 100% demands for people to come back completely 100% in person are um, having trouble because they're having trouble with diversity and inclusion. They're having trouble with um, just nobody really wants to be back 100%. So um, all of these tips that you're giving are super, I'm actually taking notes. They're super helpful. I love all of them. They're great. Um, What about your recruiting strategy as far as um, drawing in talent? Like getting on their radar because we're all competing against, you know, the big ones. And then once you get them on your radar, what's your recruiting process? Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, Shauna, we haven't been hiring for a little bit now. Like a lot of folks are in this period, you know, we've largely like just kind of held on to what we have for a period of time, which has been great for productivity because to do hiring, right. You know, as you know, it's a lot of time and energy, So we've enjoyed this period of kind of increased productivity because managers are focused on execution. I'd say, you know, we use a combination of things. Um, We're, I want to give some credit to Kleiner Perkins. Their talent team is amazing. And they always, you know, every week they distribute out a list of folks and we found some great talent from Kleiner in particular. So I think VC talent teams, um, especially good VCs um, can be very, very powerful. Um, we look, I've been in the same industry since 96, like networks pretty good. Um, so we were able to cheat a fair bit and Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one who's kind of deep in the field. Um, I'll say recruiters, you know, honestly for targeted areas when we're trying to find something, especially when the talent market was so hot, um, we had to use recruiters as well, particularly for backend engineering positions and to a certain degree for front end. Um, other things I'd say is, your website has to be good. I mean, it's the year of our Lord, 2023. Like don't have a crap website. Mm -hmm. Like your website needs to explain who you are and what you do. Recruits are going to go there. Um, I'll say recently I did hire for biz ops and finance and I went into greenhouse at the time and I had like 30 candidates who applied, like two of them were amazing. And I ended up hiring one of them. Um, So I'd say like great website and also um, LinkedIn having your LinkedIn game type, super important. And also having your social game there. So you're posting to it. So people are getting a feel of your organization on LinkedIn without even having to go to your site. Like all those are things that have worked reasonably well. Yeah. I do think, you know, some companies don't have that part dialed and I love hearing that you're um, intentional about it. Um, I think it's one of the most important roles of the CEO and founder uh, to be thinking about talent. Um, and, you know, they talk about, uh, uh, I guess it would be like employment branding versus just like the product branding, but like branding what a day in the life is like. And actually like even, even the podcast can be like a way of getting out like, Hey, what's our CEO like? And just, just giving exposure to, um, a typical employee and just access to kind of how you think and what the culture is like. Um, I think is so important because people are making decisions to join companies, not just for the product, but also just like, Hey, what's, what's a day in the life going to be like for me more than ever. I mean, I've been doing this for almost 30 years, like more than ever, that seems to be the driver for candidates these days. Um, and then just obviously thinking about process and just not making it too laborious, but also 
you know, vetting really heavily because at, at a company that's not huge, it's, it's every, every single hire matters so much. Um, so it is this like fun, it's like this art and science to it. So yeah, I love that you're thinking about it. It's great. What are the long-term goals for the business as far as like, yeah, you're, you're crushing it right now, but I'm sure you've got being the competitor that you are, um, some big goals and, um, where are you relative to those goals? Cause you're still early in the game. Yeah. I mean, we're right now it's, it's a game of just stacking up, trying to bring on as many customers as we can and making them as successful as we can. Um, that's really where we are right now. We're super happy with where the product's at. We're expanding coverage into new clouds, new data sources. Um, you know, we love our position. We're probably the only open core platform in the area. Uh, we're the most transparent. We believe we've got the most maturity, the most depth to the platform. And, you know, we're delighted to showcase that for people. So a lot of it right now is just taking what we've built over the first three years of the company and applying it to new customers, new customers, new customers, and finding a way to reach them, ways yeah. to reach them efficiently now which is what every investor is looking for. Before it was grow, grow, grow. We don't care how you spend. Now it's like, how capital efficient are you? Which is probably Perfect. how it should have always been. Yes. And, you know, so really that's where we are. I mean, goals for the company is, you know, we came here to create a category and a category that we intended to lead. So the category is forming. Like the challenge now is to become the company that not only defines it, but wins it and leads it. And that starts by putting on, even in the midst of a recession, recession be damned, whether it is or not, who cares, during this malaise, um, figuring out a way in order to show impressive growth so that even in a challenging funding environment, we can raise another round that we and you know the current investors are proud of and keep going in order to grow and, and kind of grab that, you know, that pole position in an emerging category. That's, that's yeah. been the goal from day one. And it's the goal now it hasn't, hasn't changed one iota. Yeah. And so my, my last couple of questions, cause I know that you talked about like the winning part is, you know, maybe getting up a little earlier, staying a little later, like just really doing what you can to have an edge. Um, I'm curious, and this is like a selfish question on my, on my part, but um, if you have any hacks, like what do you do to set yourself up? Um, personally and professionally for a good week, a good day? And then also, what do you do to kind of unplug, unwind, give yourself some mental space? Yeah. Yeah. So weekends are essential, uh, both for getting some space and letting the subconscious mind kind of do some problem solving and thinking about things in a different way. I tend to do a lot of my reading over the weekend. And on Sunday, Saturday is give yourself a little space um, Sunday is more of a plan for the week ahead. So I put out my weekly goals in the Trello board. I make sure I'm in good shape for all my big stuff for the week. And that if it's a big thing, I have time set aside for it on the calendar to make sure I can get to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very clearly laid out. If I don't have that done, I can't even get into the week and feel okay. I've got to have it all nailed down. I have to know what I'm going to cover my staff meeting first thing Monday morning, I have to know what I'm going to cover, you know, at our brunch together meeting and so forth. All that has to be laid down in a checklist in my Trello board before I feel good. Um, I'll usually have a project or two for the weekend as well, like a, usually a writing project, either for the podcast or reading in a writing project. And I got to get those done too. Um, the week is, is very regimented. Um, I'm up at 4.15 almost every day. I get up everything's set out beforehand. I drink my pre-workout. I go through the day. I clear out my email. I say good morning to the team. And then I go do my workout um, from like five to 6.30, usually with my trainer. Why do I use a trainer? Well, because I've injured myself too many times. History has told me that I suck at training myself. <laughs> five knee surgeries, two shoulder surgeries. I fired myself in my early 40s. So I have an amazing trainer who also lets my brain wander. So she takes care of the tough stuff with with the, my regimen and what I do. And I get to let my brain ponder all those things I primed it with around like 4.30 to 5, you know, I was getting ready. Um, and I drive in silence or listening to uh, my buddy Claude Debussy in the morning just to let my brain lock in on the day. Um, wow. so, so 5 to 6.30, incredible. Okay, so you've yeah. already done so much before people are even up. Yep. 
and then breakfast with my son. Um, there might be a phone call in between if there's something I really thought about and there's somebody on the East Coast that I'm not afraid of waking up. Our poor SE usually gets a call from me around like 6.30. So he's learned to expect that. And what time uh, then, are you going to bed? Um, I'm not Superman. I go to bed between 9 and 9.20, 9.30. So my my hack is I go to bed very early. Um, you know, the, And I really stop making decisions around 3 o'clock. Um, I cut off my kind of decision making around three because uh, I'm a huge Daniel Kahneman fan, uh, thinking fast and slow. He's the father of uh, behavioral economics. It's a dense book, um, but it's an amazing book. And what you learn from that is you have very, you have precious few frontal lobe cycles throughout the day. You have about two to three hours worth. And you're basically done with those at some point. And since I start early, all of my good high quality frontal lobe cycles are done by like two, three o'clock. So I try not to take any important meetings after three o'clock and I start to do administrative work and kind of one-on-ones and just catching up with people. Then um, I slip into family mode around like five thirty, six, six thirty, if it on a very late day. And then um, I'm starting to wind down usually by reading fantasy fiction. I'm a big geek. Like I love my sci-fi and fantasy and that shuts my brain off enough to where I can crash. I can tell I'm ready for bed and I'm, I'm ready to sleep. I put my iPad down when I've reread the same page twice. That's my heuristic. So my final question for you is what fuels you? I go back to what I said before. I love watching people, businesses, things grow to me. It's just, it's a joyous process. And to be a part of that, like it just, that's what, you know, that's really what, what drives me, you know, it, and it could be as little as like the avocado tree in the backyard of my trainer's tent. Like I can see it and I can see the little avocados growing every day, or it's, you know, watching someone accomplish something they didn't think they could do, you know, um, doing a promotion for someone, landing a big deal, um, having a customer give you a high five, like all those things are just, you know, to me, that's, that's the adventure and it's, it's pure joy.